Welcome to Love You Longmont. I'm Linda Bond and I'm so glad you're here. You know, I consider a part of art and culture to be food and wine, so that's what we're gonna do today. We have Chris McGilvery with us and he's, he's the owner of Longmont Liquors at the Depot. Now Chris, um, you love wine and you sell wine, but you have also had a heck of a year. And I'd like to talk about that before we start. Okay. You were named one of the 40 under 40 by Boulder Valley Biz West. You are also the Micro Business of the Year for the Chamber of Commerce. Now, I think it's challenging because this year, in front of the depot, there was tremendous construction. I don't think most people could have made it through that. You know, it was uh, quite stunning. So through this process, um, it's a relationship-driven business mm -hmm. that I'm in, and this community has been fantastic. I mean, there were times when literally if you didn't own a helicopter and you couldn't fly in from the sky to get to my shop, oh, no. like you couldn't get to me. And despite all of that, um, just the support that we've had through this process, um, yeah, truly has been a special year for us. You also teach at Front Range Community College. Yes. And you did your dissertation on entrepreneurs of brick and mortar businesses. Yes. Which is what you have. Yes. Yeah. Um, let's talk about your philosophy of wine. I think that uh, I'm going to ask you today to pair some wines with some foods that we're going to go see videos of that are made right here in Longmont. But you don't ordinarily just arbitrarily tell people what to drink. Right. Um, first, you have to be passionate for what you do. Mm -hmm. And I've developed such a, a, a deep level of passion for wine, especially uh, passionate about drinking wine. Uh -huh. So um, I really like to think of um, my customer experience at my shop as not selling customers wine, but really building a relationship with mm -hmm. them and um, identifying like what their needs are, uh -huh. um, what the situation is, and what their unique palate is, and tailor their experience to them. Because there's no right answer in the world of wine. Mm -hmm. I mean, honestly, the more I learn about wine, <laughs> the more I realize I don't know anything about wine. <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we do have a strategy with um, all of our customers. Mm -hmm. it's a, we, we leverage a three-step process. Oh, tell us that. I think that'd be really interesting to know. Yeah, so um, at Longmont Liquors, we, uh, we have a three-step process that uh -huh. starts uh -huh. the very first step, the, very, the most important step, uh -huh. drink wine you like. Oh. Don't drink wine you don't like. It yeah. seems silly, yeah. <laughs> but the wine spectator, the wine enthusiast, Robert Parker, myself, we may have a certain preference of wines and we may like a certain wine, mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean that Linda likes that. So right. <laughs> it's, it's understanding your unique palate and tailoring it to you. So this is where it gets really, really exciting for, um, for you because you get to try different wines <laughs> and really explore and there's so many resources that are available uh -huh. um, to us as consumers in the world of wine. Um, what, like the wine, wine Folly book that I leverage with my customers. There's so many resources that are out there. So, uh -huh. But the bottom line is um, it's, it's about you. It's okay. about the customer. And so the first step is really tr trying to figure out what you like. What's the, the second step? So the second step is strategy. You uh -huh. have to pick a strategy. And there's two strategies. One is a complementary strategy, uh -huh. meaning when you're pairing your wine with your meals, mm -hmm. um, if you're having a big, bold, juicy meal, like a juicy steak, uh -huh. you want to pair that with a big, bold, juicy red wine, like a Zinfandel or a Cabernet or something uh -huh. like that. Uh -huh. So that's one strategy. The other strategy is a contrasting strategy. Uh -huh. And a good example that I like to share with my customers to help yeah. them understand what that is, it's, it's as if you're adding lemon to your fish. It brings, right. it lifts the experience um, to a whole nother level. So it's two contrasting flavors magnifying the experience. So that's step two. And three. So the third step, this is where it gets really detailed. Uh, it's about tactics or what I like to refer to as the wine pillars. Hmm. So some of the wine pillars include the fruit intensity, uh -huh. the body of the wine, the tannins, and the levels of acidity. And all those main wine pillars play a massive role in shaping and influencing the wine flavor. Well, I can't wait to do the, this 
test with you. We have gone out around Longmont to some interesting places and we brought back foods. And I'm going to show you a video and then ask you what kind of wine you would do. And first we're going to a goat farm. Well, one of the reasons we wanted to see you today is we're very interested in goat cheese. So yes. I'm hoping that you'll show us all the different steps to make goat cheese. For sure. It's actually easier than you might think. The hardest part about making good chev or goat uh -huh. cheese is getting a good supply of fresh goat's milk. Uh -huh. And that's something I don't have any trouble with. <laughs> all right, let's go look at your goats. Okay. She'll just stand here while we milk her out. And then we just take this milk and put it through a filter right into the jar. And then I will usually take this milk in and pasteurize it. Kate, this is the actual milk that you got from the goats, and you're going to turn it into cheese. Tell us about the steps that you go through. Okay, well, so the first thing we're going to do is actually we're going to pasteurize this milk. Mm -hmm. So um, this was the bit that didn't fit in that container. I'm just going to filter it into the pot. Good. And if you want to unscrew that lid for me. And so to pasteurize milk, it's pretty simple. You just need a heavy pot like this that has a good double clad bottom because we're going to get it pretty warm. Mm -hmm. um, and we're just going to put the milk in, put a little thermometer so we know our temperatures. Uh -huh. And we're going to heat this milk up to, I do a pasteurization temperature of 161 for 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. And we're stirring the milk while we're heating it. And then we'll have, and then we'll cool it down quickly so that we have nice pasteurized milk. So after this would be pasteurized, um, we would bring it down to about, oh, about 75 degrees, mm -hmm. and we would add our ingredients. Now, chev, which means goat in French, or chevre, um, is the classic soft goat cheese. Okay. And to make chev, we need some culture, and we need some rennet. So chev itself takes about 24 hours to make, and we didn't have 24 <laughs> hours together. So I've got some things to different stages. So I started this pot last night. This was pasteurized milk from yesterday yesterday's milking and I brought it up to about 75 degrees and I added a culture called mesophilic culture. So mesophilic is one of the most common cultures in cheese making. Um, mesophilic is kind of medium temperature um, and we would just have taken for a half gallon of milk about an eighth of a teaspoon. Really small a little bit of culture. Sprinkle it on that milk. Let it mix in. Let it sit for about two hours at room temperature right. and at that time what's happening is the culture is starting consuming the lactose, which is the milk sugar, and converting it to lactic acid. And after about two hours, I add my rennet. Rennet is an enzyme that coagulates milk. Oh, this is chemistry. It is chemistry. <laughs> so we put a little bit of that rennet in, and then we just let the pot sit for 12 hours. Mm -hmm. And so while I was sleeping, chev was being made. It's kind of amazing. So now we're at the 12 hour mark, and what you'll see here, if you look, Oh, we have this beautiful curd. I don't know if we can see this here, but this whole pot of milk is one big curd, and that liquid you see floating on the top? Whey. Whey. Ah. Very good. So we have our curds in our whey, but we don't want all that whey in our cheese. We want to dry our cheese. So our next step is that we're going to take those curds and spoon them out into our waiting cheesecloth. So once we get those curds in here, we just take opposite corners of our cheesecloth and tie them together to form a little bag. And the next stage of this cheese, which is about another 12 hours, is that this has to drip. So if you don't want to stand here for 12 hours letting it drip. Although it's fun. Yes, it would be good exercise. Um, a couple options. One is you could hang it on your faucet while you're sleeping and let it just drip into the sink all night. Or you could have a big pot like this and you could just hang it on the edge of the pot so that it can drip into the pot. But basically we're just going to use gravity and evaporation to remove the remaining whey from this curd. And after about 12 hours of hanging, 
we'll have a bag that looks more like this. So this looked like that before it hung for 12 hours. And now this is our finished cheese. But what we would do is just sprinkle a little bit of salt onto the curd. For about a half gallon, you only need about a quarter teaspoon of salt. And we would just kind of work it into the curd with the fork. All right, so now this is finished chev, but I'm gonna give you a really special version of this cheese. And that is even, um, special than even more special <laughs> than that. This just will be, show you how pretty you can make your little wheel or log of cheese. Oh, so, so this good. is a beautiful herb salt that is actually made locally here mm, by lovely. my friend Gail. Um, and she makes this right here in Hygiene. Actually, I think she produces it down in Boulder, but she lives in Hygiene. And with very clean hands, mm -hmm. we would form our chev into a log. So you know the definition of an artisan cheesemaker? Oh. is small batches and minimal mechanization. So it doesn't get much more minimal than <laughs> using your hands to shape the log, right? But we'll form this real pretty little log and then we'll just roll it in Gail's beautiful herb salt. Oh my goodness. And because this has some salt in it, we didn't need to salt the curd very much in the first mm -hmm. place. That's and lovely. this is like a, kind of an herbs to Provence with some tarragon and vinegar. You mm -hmm. can smell how good that smells, mm -hmm. huh? I didn't yeah. realize how very hands on this is. It this is, movie. it is. How wonderful. And so we'll get a clean plate for you here and some crackers, and you can taste our homemade chef. That we made ourselves. From our very own goat's milk, yep, which is how I got started being a cheesemaker, because when you have milk, you gotta do something with all that milk, so you learn to make cheese. Oh, it's wonderful. Isn't that lovely? Ooh, thank you so much. I yeah. can taste the herbs and the salt. Exactly. Isn't it tasty? Mm, yeah. And there's lots of different things you could do with this. You could mix honey into it. Mm. You could chop up olives and put those in it. Just about anything you can think of, you could make your chev flavored. Um, yep. So that's your really basic, most simple cheese. Kate Johnson, thank you so much. This is just brilliant. We appreciate it. Oh, you're so welcome. It was so much fun meeting Kate Johnson's goats. And how incredible to have her milk the goats and turn it into cheese right in front of us. But now for your challenge, Chris. What wine would you put with this goat cheese? So Linda, goat cheese can be challenging to pair with at times because it has many different layers of flavors that yeah. add um, complexity and a, a potential funky character to it. Huh. So um, I would highly recommend a Sauvignon Blanc, um, particularly from the Marlboro country, um, region of uh -huh. New Zealand. Um, oh, really? So 85% of the wines produced out of this particular region are Sauvignon Blancs. Uh -huh. So what makes this perfect is it has high acidity, um, high fruit, which um, definitely um, balances well with what the goat cheese brings. So this is a fantastic um, pairing. Oh, that's wonderful. So generally, like they say, it would be a white wine with a cheese. So with goat cheese particularly, just mm -hmm. because of all the complexities it brings, uh -huh. um, you want a wine that has high acidity uh -huh. and you want a wine that has high fruit. Okay. And that's why Sauvignon Blanc it would be the perfect pairing. All right. Well, we have a next challenge for you. We went to Hefe's, and I love Hefe's. But rather than just making a standard taco, he made uh, shrimp tacos and ahi tuna. So let's go look. This is Sean Gaffner and he's the owner and the chef for both The Roost and Hefe's. Tell us a little bit about your life. How did you come to be a chef? Well, I grew up in the, uh, on a farm in Cattle Ranch in the middle of California called the San Joaquin Valley and uh, started working my first summer as an eight-year-old and worked every summer and, uh, until I graduated high school and was just set to get off the farm uh, as soon as I graduated. <laughs> that's really hard work. Oh, so much hard work. And so uh, my first year of college, I um, got in the restaurant industry and started serving tables and just fell in love with the, the high pace, you know, high energy really hectic to a lot of people. I mean, you either love it or hate it, and I just loved it. I couldn't believe they were paying me to do it. It's just partying with people and making tips. and oh. So I didn't want to serve my whole life, so I went to culinary school out in Sacramento called Golden State Culinary Institute, and uh, graduated in 2000, and just been doing this ever since. 
The two restaurants have been in my heart for years, oh. uh, especially growing up on that farm. We would eat, taco trucks would drive out to the farm at around lunchtime and we'd eat off them and, um, or the late night thing in the small farm town is at mid, the taco trucks come out at like 10.30 at night until 2 a.m., kind of getting that bar crowd. So in high school, like the cool thing to do was go out to Barasa's taco truck and get these carne asada tacos, at, you know, at, at 10, 11, 12 o'clock at night. And so, uh, you know, both the kind of authentic Mexican um, has always been in me. And then I've really done mostly fine dining and really upscale since I graduated culinary school. And so it's kind of the mix, the modern American cuisine with the authentic Mexican. And so we, we moved out here two and a half years ago because we found the opportunity with the Roost building. And that was something I really wanted to do. I'd been wanting to get out of fine dining and do my own kind of breakout um, craft casual cuisine. And so we did the Roost and that went amazing for a year and being in Longmont, falling in love with the city and, and specifically Main Street and downtown. And then this opportunity came up and I instantly just kind of, even the way it's shaped and it just felt like this really fun, modern, you know, taco and tequila concept. Huh? And so we pulled the trigger and it's, we just finished our one year here. So we wanted to open this concept that felt like happy hour all the time. Oh. So people come in and they're like, is it happy hour? And our answer is always, yeah, it's always happy hour. <laughs> you can always get a $4 marg and a $2 taco. Oh, and actually okay. we do the street tacos for $1 on Tuesdays. Oh. And Tuesdays are just insane in here, open to close, and we I love it. They are. Well, I have to come on Tuesday. <laughs> um, I think that some of the ingredients you use in your tacos mm -hmm. are like the ahi, would su totally surprise people. How do you come up with those? Oh, gosh. Well, specifically seafood. I mean, being a... a chef in California for so many years. I mean, I just love all things seafood. So some of our top sellers are the seared ahi. We do this mango shrimp, where it's like a crispy tempura shrimp with a honey sauce and mango and fresh basil. Um, that and then our fried fish taco. Those are some of our top three selling tacos. So I love seafood and, and when you and your staff love something, it definitely it translates to the customers. Oh, that's so neat. And I think people probably like the experimental aspect of it. Mm -hmm. You can surprise them still. Mm -hmm. And we can please every palate. You know, we get a lot of people that come in and every time they get the buffalo chicken taco. And that's more like getting chicken wings at a sports bar than it is getting a Mexican food somewhere. Right, that's true. Well, you uh, are going to cook for us, is that right? Uh, sure, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> let's do it. All right, so this is one of our really popular tacos, the mango shrimp taco. We use a crispy tempura battered shrimp, fresh diced mango, mango and uh, fresh basil, tossed in our honey sauce we make here, um, right there on the tortilla. And then just for a little contrasting color and a little bit of freshness on the plate, we garnish it with that red bell pepper brunoise. You eat with your eyes first, right? All right, next I'll do our seared ahi taco. A little fresh cabbage with a ginger lime crema. A fresh slice of avocado. Those two slices of ahi with our jefe seasoning. And this is just a sriracha aioli. And that gets a little fresh cilantro. And they all get limes. So that's two of our top tacos, seared ahi and mango shrimp here at Jefe's. All right, Linda, eat up. Enjoy. I think I better put the lime Oh yeah. First. Everything needs a little zest of a lime. Oh, that's lovely. Thank you. Ooh, yeah. It's going to be a big bite. Yeah. Mm. That is so good. Thanks. Hefe's tacos are so good. But I think we have to take into consideration there were two different tacos. Would you do the same wine for the the shrimp and the ahi tuna? So Linda, um, a good rule of thumb when it comes to pairing wines with meat dishes uh -huh. is traditionally the lighter the meat, mm -hmm. the lighter the wine. The darker the meat, the darker the wine. So we do have two um, unique dishes from Sean and his team at Hefe's. Um, the first being the shrimp tacos. Uh -huh. um, what would pair excellent with that is a more of a light bodied white. Uh -huh. This wine has excellent acidity. Um, it's um, our gold medal Pinot Gris from the uh -huh. depot. This is uh, Amity Vineyards. Uh -huh. um, this is from the Willamette Valley, Oregon, who make fantastic, light, refreshing, vigorating wines. Oh. Um, so that would pair excellent with the shrimp. Um, and then the other taco is the ahi tuna. Now the ahi tuna has 
It's a little bit more bold. Mm -hmm. And so what I th would pair well is a Rioja. You definitely can't go wrong with a, Re a Spanish Rioja. A so, Rioja. Rioja. That means so. red something. <laughs> <laughs> so this is an excellent Rioja. It's medium bodied. Uh -huh. It's got just the right level of fruits mm -hmm. to match what the ahi tacos um, bring to the table. And then the fruit and the tannins cut right through the, um, the fat and the spice of the sriracha, oh. which really, really intensifies um, your experience. Oh, this is so good. So. I think I'm starting to understand, Chris. <laughs> Let's do an even more challenging one. How about a full-bodied pizza? Let's take a look. My name is Michael Viscoccio. I am 38 years in Longmont with Old Fashioned Bavarian Bakery. Now we decide opening new Old World Pizzeria. We build a brand new wood fire brick oven all our ingredients, everything is made in-house, all natural, chemical-free. And we'll be happy showing you around. Hi, I'm Alex Reppi. I work at Old World Pizza. I'll be taking you through the steps making a, a wood-fired pizza. Now we're going to put the pizza in the oven and uh, it's going to cook for uh, about eight minutes at about 600 degrees and uh, after that it should be perfect. This looks very good and very spicy. A lot of different kinds of layers on it. I can't wait to see what kind of a wine will go with this. Mmm. <laughs> oh my gosh, it's delicious. Want some? <laughs> that was so good. Some people might not know where that is. That's the new brick oven. The place is called the Bavarian Bakery, but they've also added an old world pizzeria. And I think those might be kind of challenging flavors because it was prosciutto, it was salami, it was a homemade tomato sauce and cheese. What would you do with that? So you're definitely right, Linda. It presents um, <laughs> different elements to take into consideration. I love pairing wine with pizza. So it's oh. a traditional Italian meal, obviously. Uh -huh. And so we can't go wrong with Italy. Oh. So Italy makes fantastic red blends that pair well with a dish like this. Oh, so um, Italy, so has been producing wines for 2,800 years. <laughs> so they so know their business. They know their business, <laughs> and they produce over 2,000 different grape varieties. So, and they produce more wine than any other country. And so, what goes really nicely with this we have here is a Dogojolo red blend from Tuscany. 80% Sangiovese, 20% Cabernet. So it's real medium-bodied, real smooth, easy drinking and balances really nicely. And the 20% of the Cabernet um, really brings enough body and richness mm -hmm. to the ingredients like the sausage. So I would highly recommend this. They are in for a treat. Oh, really? And on those four things you told us about, fruit and tannin and acid, how does this? So Italian wines are really, really bold. So this is high in fruit, uh -huh. medium bodied, so it's not too over the top, which makes it really, really nice um, for this type of dish. Oh, how nice. Well, we're going to challenge you further. Let's go look at some dessert. We're going to La Mamo, La Mamo Maze for dessert. 
I'm with Michelle Bretsky at the Mama May's Bakery. Now, Michelle, what is it that makes this bakery so special? Well, one of the first things that makes it special is that it's family owned. My mom and I own the bakery and we are very much family involved. We uh, make all of our stuff with a lot of love and a lot of recipes from my mom's mom as well as my dad's mom. So we get to bake a lot of things that have come throughout the generations. Why do you think it's important to be in Longmont? Longmont is a gem. Um, community here is so important. It's important to us. Um, everyone, um, whether it's big business, small business, everyone, everyone wants to see you succeed. So the support and um, that you get from other businesses, even in the same industry, is amazing. It's great, perfect. Today we have Death by Chocolate Cupcakes. So it's a chocolate cupcake, and we fill each with a chocolate ganache filling. Mm. And then we take a bag of chocolate buttercream, pipe that on each cupcake, just so. And then we drizzle the ganache across the top mm. for decoration and for more chocolate. <laughs> And then we add some chocolate curls to the top of each one also. And then that's called our Death by Chocolate Cupcake. So that's chocolate. Okay, how about carrot? And then these are our carrot cupcakes. Okay. We make those with uh, walnuts and pineapple also in the cupcake. And we top it with a cream cheese icing. So we take our uh, cream cheese bag and pipe on the cream cheese. And for decoration, we sprinkle a few of the walnuts right on top. So that makes our carrot cupcakes. Kathy, those are beautiful. I can't wait to see what wine we'll throw at them. Right. And then today we also have two of our pecan pies that just came out of the oven for a special order today. So we've got those right nice and warm. And then coming out of the oven would be some brownies shortly. So thank you so much. You're welcome. Lovely. Thank you. Now, Chris, what wine would you put with the chocolate cupcakes? So Linda, we've put all of our, this time and energy into fixing this ideal dinner, uh -huh. and we paired that perfectly with wine. So it's really, really important that we make an amazing dessert wine pairing, especially since it's La Mama May's. <laughs> <You're> right. <laughs> <laughs> so with the, with the chocolate cake, I would recommend a port, which is a traditional dessert wine, and we've got, I, I, we have to have some Colorado representation. <laughs> That's right. So this is Ten Bears Winery. So this is out of La Porte, Colorado. Uh -huh. Fantastic port. So it's fortified. It's got really dark fruit, like uh -huh. ruby, Ooh. cherries, and it would really, really contrast. This is a contrast strategy because uh -huh. it's really, really sweet, high sweet, so which really makes the sugar and the sweet contrast nicely. Mm, sounds lovely. How about the carrot? cupcakes. With the carrot cupcakes, I have here my favorite Moscato out of Italy. Oh, I love Moscato. Um, it's fantastic. So La Morandino, 2015, uh -huh. high sweets, and so again, it's a contrasting strategy. Great fruit, great uh -huh. citrusy fruits, and it's got floral notes and a hint of earth, but it really, really will magnify the, your experience. Chris, I know that you have brought a little something that people who are watching can get. Can you offer that? Yeah, so basically what we use here, this is a resource that we give all of our customers uh -huh. um, in our shop. So thanks to Wine Folly here, uh -huh. we have this easy, simple to read tool um, that walks you through all the basics on how to pair your wines, um, how to pair with your chicken. Uh -huh. And on the flip side, this goes into the, the wine pillars that I oh, mentioned yes. earlier to kind of help guide our customer into their perfect uh, wine pairing. Thank you so much. This is Chris McGilbray and I want to thank you did a wonderful job and he is Longmont Liquors at the Depot. I'd also like to thank Kathy Hall whose art is behind us today and I'd like to thank all of you for enjoying our wine pairing.